All right. Introduction to Political Science, Chapter 1. What is politics and what is political science? <clears throat> uh, so we're going There's another one. Chapter Outline, Defining Politics, Who Gets What, When, Where, How, and Why. Public Policy, Public Interest, and Power, Political Science, The Systematic Study of Politics, Normative Political Science, Empirical Political Science, Individuals, Groups, Institutions, and International Relations. Introduction. If you own a smartphone, you are involved with politics and is involved with you. Wherever you live, the political decisions your government makes are likely to affect what is on your phone and how you can use it. China has banned apps like Facebook, Google. Before the 2021 Ugandan election, the government simply shuts down the internet entirely. In India, the government distributes benefits directly to citizens through their phones. In the United States, Government regulations, uh, one type of rules that are created through political action, touch virtually every aspect of your phone's production, sale, and communications. Your phone also enables you to engage in political action. You can use your phone to talk about politics or call your local representative or express to express your views. You can organize a campaign through WhatsApp, share videos of police brutality or a peaceful protest, or Venmo contributions to your favorite political cause. You can use your phone to learn about politics, political engagement, and what politi politicians are doing at home and around the world. <clears throat> the political decisions of local and national governments <clears throat> and international organizations can affect the water you drink, the food you eat and the clothes you wear, and the dwelling you call home. Politics and policy can play a role in the most immediate or intimate details of your life, including your reproductive rights, marriage rights, and even how your body will be treated after you die. Politics is everywhere. Whether you, uh, whether or not you care about politics, politics has an interest in you. When you develop a competent understanding of politics and political science, you are better prepared, you are a better prepared citizen, political actor, and job seeker. With a more sophisticated understanding of politics and political science, you can better understand questions of who gets what, when, how, and perhaps most important, why. The quality of our politics depends to a larger degree on the quality of citizen engagement. Want a better government with politicians who possess greater integrity <clears throat> and policies that more closely reflect the public interest? <clears throat> These things will not happen automatically or on their own. They will happen if informed citizens work together to make them happy. Then you think like a political scientist, you, or when you think like a political scientist, you, you seek evidence and carefully scrutinize that evidence. In politics, as well as other areas of your life, doing so helps to inoculate you from misinformation and manipula manipulation. Oh, that was funny. <laughs> when you are asked, why did this political event happen, or... What did you, uh, do you think will happen? You are able to respond, the evidence suggests, or the research indicates, or even I don't know. But in similar circumstances, scientific thinking enables you to navigate the complex political world. This chapter will introduce you to the world of politics and the systematic study of political science. You will learn some of the fundamental principles of politics as well as core concepts. 1.1, defining politics. Who gets what, when, where, how, and why? Learning outcomes. By the end of this section, you will be able to define and describe politics from various perspectives, identify what makes a political a behavior political, identify and discuss the three core elements of any political event, rules, reality, and choices, define and discuss varieties of con constitutions. <clears throat> I feel like I read this already. Hold on one sec. 
Um, uh, let's go here. Here. Just got to check this real quick. Transform one. It's probably. It's just like sociology. All these things sound so freaking similar. Um, OpenStax Biology, OpenStax Sociology, Astronomy, Psychology, World History, Economics, Philosophy, Anthropology. Yeah, I guess it's just... It just sounds so similar. I just, I had to, sorry. Okay. Politics has existed as long as humans have faced scarcity, <clears throat> have had different beliefs and preferences, and have had to resolve these differences while allocating scarce resources. It will continue to exist so long as these human conditions persist, that is, forever. Political politics are fundamental to the human condition. Politics means different things to different people. Politics. A, and related terms like political and politician can have both positive and negative connotations. The Greek philosopher Aristotle argued that humans were political animals and that only by engaging in politics could humans reach their highest potential. Yet often, the terms political and politician can be used in disparaging ways to refer to individuals using trickery or manipulation to obtain or preserve their status or authority. More formally, a politician is someone running for elective office or serving it or serving in it as a person who is using the skills of a politician in other social interaction. A political actor is anyone who is engaged in political activity. Politics involves all the actions of government and all the people who work for it, serve or challenge it. <clears throat> This book takes the broadest view, adopting the guidance of political scientist Harold Laswell, who defined politics as who gets what, when, how. Politics exists wherever people interact with one another to make decisions that affect them collectively. Politics exists within families <clears throat> when parents decide where the family will, li family will live. Politics, the family, uh, gets a place to live at the point of decision based on parents' choice. When your school decides what tuition to charge, politics. When the government imposes taxes or gov funds education, politics. Most generally, politics is any interaction among individuals, groups, or institutions that seek to arrive at a decision about how to make a collective choice or to solve uh, some collective problem. Political science focuses primarily on these interactions as they involve governments. Every political event is different. The mass protests in Hong Kong in 2020, inspired by those seeking to protect their political rights, were not exactly the same as the Black Lives Matter protests in the United States or the climate change actions animated by Swedish environmental activist Greta Thunberg. Yet as varied as political situations can be, there are commonalities across these events and over all political activities. Whenever you seek to understand a political event, Whenever, uh, whether an election in Tanzania, a protest in Estonia, or a public health program in Indonesia, it is useful to focus on the following. What are the most important rules? What is the reality of the existing events or environment? What choices do the participants make? Political outcomes, for example, which candidates win, wins an election, are based on the interaction of these rules, realities, and choices. Rules. The importance of rules in politics or in life cannot be overstated. In virtually every human endeavor, the most successful individuals are likely to have a keen knowledge of the rules and how to use the rules to the advantage of their cause. Ignorance of the rules makes accomplishing your goals more difficult. Rules can be highly precise or open to interpretation. In chess, for example, the rules are completely known to all players. Each piece can move in certain directions, but in no other ones. Each player takes a turn. That's the rule. Although chess is highly complex, each player's options at any given time are known. Chess champions, in fact, all champions 
know how to use the rules to their advantage. College campuses have their own sets of formal and informal rules, and not all of them are as precise as those in chess. The de jure rules are the rules as they are written, the formal rules. The de facto rules are the ones actually practiced or enforced. The informal rules, for example, a sign might state that the speed limit is 55 miles per hour, but if police do not give tickets to drivers unless they are driving 65 miles per hour, then that is the de facto rule. To thrive at college, it is useful to understand not only the formal rules, but also the informal rules, which have been called the hidden curriculum. The rules in any political environment affect who has power and how they can use it. Consider the rules that determine who can vote and how. These rules can be permissive or strict, making voting either easier or harder to do. The harder it is to vote, the fewer people will act actually cast their ballots and vice versa. Voting rules influence who shows up to vote. Politicians who believe they have a better chance of success under permissive voting rules are likely to advocate for such rules, while politicians who believe they are more likely to prevail under restrictive voting rules will advocate for them instead. Rules might appear to be neutral, that is, they may seem fair and not designed to favor one group over another, but this is not entirely true. Until recently, to become a pilot in the U.S. Air Force, a person had to be no shorter than 5 feet 4 inches and no taller than 6 feet 5 inches. The short and the tall were excluded from this opportunity. The rule might be in place for a good reason, in this case, to ensure that pilots can fit properly into their seats, but rules like these allocate opportunities and resources to some while withholding them from others. Because this rule excluded over 40% of American women from becoming pilots, it has been modified. Rules are everywhere in politics. Your family has rules, even if the main rule is no rules, as does your school. Rules, such as Robert's Rules of Order, govern legislatures, and the criminal justice system, the tax system, and the, and the national immigration systems are all based, at least in principle, on rules. Rules and institutions are closely related the institution of marriage or the institution of family, for example, are the sets of rules by which those within the marriage or family live. Alternatively, institutions can be organizations which are groups of people working together for a common purpose whose actions are governed by rules. Perhaps the most important set of rules for any institution or organization is its constitution. The constitution affirms the most basic legal principles of a country or a state. These principles typically include the structure of the government, its duties, and the rights of the people. Constitutions can be quite, quite general or extremely detailed. The Constitution of Monaco has fewer than 4,000 words, while the Constitution of India has nearly 150,000 words. Unlike the United States, some countries, including Canada, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom, do not have a single document they call the Constitution, but instead rely on other written and unwritten sources in most countries, the Constitution is just called that, the Constitution. Although Germany, Oman, Saudi Arabia, and other countries call their Constitution the basic law. <clears throat> Constitutions are perhaps the most important set of rules in a country because, after all, they are just pieces of paper. The true importance of a country's Constitution depends on the politics of that country. In the United States, the Constitution is venerated almost as if it were a religious document. Most of the biggest conflicts throughout U.S. history have involved disputes over what the Constitution requires, allows, or prohibits when the U.S. Supreme Court rules that a political action is unconstitutional. The violator, whether it be the President, Congress, or any other group or individual in society, is expected to comply with the ruling and stop the action. But this is not always the case everywhere. Politicians in any country may be tempted to ignore their constitutions, especially when it comes to the rights they ostensibly guarantee, and whether those politicians prevail depends on whether, or po whether other political actors are willing and able to uphold the constitution. Because rules affect the allocation of power and other scarce resources, political actors spend substantial time and effort fighting over them. In general, political actors seek to establish rules that benefit them and their allies. Reality. Rules guide and constrain behavior, but the reality on the ground at any specific time also impacts political outcomes. Reality, facts, is not a matter of opinion. Although people can dispute the nature of reality, something is a fact, for example, when there is compelling evidence that an event has happened 
where a condition exists. The sun rises in the east, reality. The United Nations is an international organization, fact. Has the United Nations made the world a better place? That is a matter of opinion, although those who say yes or no can provide facts uh, that support their views about reality. How candidates can raise and spend money on their electoral campaigns may be limited by campaign finance laws. But if one candidate raises twice as much money as the other candidate, that, that is an important factor. If one candidate is the incumbent, a politician already serving in office and running for re-election, and the other is not, that is an important factor. These are importantly facts because whether or not a candidate is an incumbent and how much campaign money they raise may affect their chances of winning the election. In U.S. elections, for example, incumbents generally have a better chance of being elected, while the impact of fundraising on electoral success is open to question. In chess, the rulers are constant, never changing during the game. The reality changes as, plays, as play proceeds. At any moment, each player has a specific number of pieces, in particular, places on the board. What happens then depends on the choices the player makes. players make. This is as true for politics as for any other game. A key difference between chess and politics is that, in politics, the players themselves can change the rules of the game while they are playing. Politics can be thought of as having the characteristics of a game. The players, anyone involved in political action, make strategic choices given the rules of the current conditions in an attempt to win the game by obtaining their goals. Choices. Rules provide constraints and opportunities. Reality presents resources and challenges. The choices participants make in the face of rules and reality determine political outcomes. Choice exists whenever political actors face options, which they always do. If there are two candidates in an election for a single position, the voter has to choose between them, not being able to vote for it for both. Even if there is only one candidate, the voter has, still has an option to vote for the candidate or to abstain. In a democracy, the winning candidate wins more uh, because more voters chose to vote and vote for that candidate than for other, can or other options. The very definition of democracy is that it is a form of government in which the people have the ability to choose their leaders or, in some cases, the policies that they will adopt. Political outcomes are always contingent. They cannot be predicted with certain uh, certainty in advance. That does not mean, however, that outcomes are completely unpredictable. By accounting for the rules, how human behavior works in existing realities, it is possible to reasonably predict what is likely to happen and explain what does happen. Oh, jeez. 1.2, public policy, public interest and power, learning outcomes. By the end of this section, you will be able to define public policy, public interest and power, define sovereignty, distinguish among the terms country, state, nation, and nation state, define political conflict, identify the status quo, identify three bargaining outcomes. Public policy is one of the main products of politics. Public policy includes all the decisions governments make to influence behavior. When a legislature enacts legislation, an executive issues an order, or a court announces a ruling, they are all making public policy. In making public policy, political actors typically invoke the public interest. The public interest is an amorphous concept, although it is generally defined as the well-being of the public. It is invisible to our senses, and it is possible to maintain that it does not exist because there is no interest beyond what individuals want for themselves. Those who claim to seek the public interest typically believe that it is not just what people want, however, but what but they should want. It, should, it would not be in the public interest in this view to create a society in which those in power can exploit others or one that legitimately uh, legitimizes cruelty even if a majority of the population wanted these things. It is in the public interest to create a good society, one, of, one with social justice in which the government serves the people. Such a society would provide for, a common, for the common good and promote the general welfare. Power, a fundamentally important term in the study of politics, 
can be defined as the ability to compel someone to do something that they would not otherwise choose to do. Those with power are the ones who get to make public policy. Power cannot be counted, weighed, or photographed, though it is invisible. The accoutrements of power, for example, being addressed as, as president of the United States or having people salute you can often be seen. Some people have a lot of power, while others have very little. Power is not a constant force, as politicians sometimes increase their power, while at other times their power slips away. Power is, in part, a matter of belief. If you believe someone has power over you, they do at least to the, to the extent that you, uh, that you do what they want. The highest form of power is called sovereign power. If no other entity has authority over a state, that state is said to have sovereignty, and the supreme authority in that state is called the sovereign. In many countries, the sovereign is the highest ranking individual leader, such as the queen or king. In the United States and in other democracies, the people are sovereign, not their elected officials. The people elect their leaders, and the people can unseat them either by selecting others in the next election or by removing them. For example, through impeachment, a legal process for removing elected officials from their posts for misconduct. The power of any governmental institution depends on the de jure and de facto rules of the country. In Saudi Arabia, for example, the consultative assembly has neither the power uh, to pass nor enforce laws. Its members are appointed by the king, who is an absolute monarch, and he can remove them at his pleasure. In the United States, as discussed in Chapter 9 legislatures, the Congress has substantial powers only it can approve uh, by uh, the spending of governmental money or declare war. The President can veto legislation approved by Congress, but Congress has the power to override a President's veto. Government use, government and the legislative use of power. The government is the most important institution in any discussion of politics because it is the only one with legal legitimate authority to use coercive power to compel behavior within a defined geographic area. The government of a place typically exercises its powers over individuals who live within its borders who are with otherwise subject to its laws. If you break your family's rules, your family can punish you, but only your government can imprison you for breaking government laws. Your church may ask you to contribute money but only the governments can compel you to pay taxes. Your business can encourage you to uphold their rules and fight for their interests, but only the government can require you to serve in the military and sit on juries. A government is one of the four elements that along with territory, population, and sovereignty make up a state. The United States is a state, and so are the individual territories from Alabama to Wyoming within it. <clears throat> Afghanistan and Zimbabwe are states too, <clears throat> as are all the other 190 some countries between them alphabetically. State has other meanings that are also relevant to politics and political science. For example, a country might be called a police state. In a police state, the government uses force often imposed by the military or the secret police to repress dissent and maintain order. order. In a welfare state, the government provides extensive social benefits like childcare, education, housing, and pensions. Countries are more or less police and welfare states, as all countries use a police force to maintain order, and all countries offer their citizens some social benefits. North Korea, where the government monitors virtually every aspect of life and imprisons or executes those who oppose its leaders, is perhaps the most extreme example of a police state. Nordic countries, including Denmark, Finland, Norway, Iceland, and Sweden, are generally considered to be the most generous welfare states. The term country, state, nation, and nation state sometimes used synonymously, but they are not at all identical. <clears throat> a country is def a defined geographic territory with a sovereign government. The term state is often used to refer to a smaller area within a country, as in the case with the individual American states, which all together make up for the Amer United States of America, the country. The term state can also be used to refer uh, used to refer to an entire country. For example, India is a state. A nation, in contrast, refers to a population connected by history, culture, and beliefs that generally <clears throat> lives in a specific area, such as Kurdistan and the Middle East, 
or the Kurdish are the dominant ethnic group, even though they do not have a country to call their own. A nation that also is a country is sometimes called a nation state. The United States, France, Pakistan, China, and many others are generally considered simultaneously to be countries, states, nations, and nation states. <clears throat> a government has authority when those subject to its power recognize that power. In a class, you accept your teacher's power to give assignments and assign grades, or at least your school recognizes these powers. Authority is generally limited to specific circumstances and places where the authority is said to have jurisdiction. As a condition for passing this course, your teacher can require you to read this book, but not to do their laundry. Your government can require you to pay your taxes. It has this authority, but it cannot require you to do things that are unlawful. <clears throat> when authority is used in ways that are consistent with the duties or rules of the institution, that authority is said to be legitimate. If a police officer pulls your car over because you are speeding, that is a legitimate use of authority. If that officer pulls you over because you are driving while black, that would be an illegitimate use. In politics, there is a continual struggle over which uses of authority are legitimate and which are not, and is discussed in Chapter 13, Governing Regimes, Governments resolve these conflicts in different ways depending on how democratic they are. What can a government compel you to do, allow you to do, or prohibit you from doing? One possible answer is that if a government enacts a policy in accordance with its own rules, then that policy is legitimate. In this view, individuals could enslave others so long as government policy allowed this practice, as some countries have. Another answer is that some policies, such as slavery, are fundamentally, fundamentally illegitimate even if they are lawfully enacted. Conflict and bargaining. Disagreement. That is, conflict is, a fund is fundamental to politics for two primary reasons. As long as there is desire and people want things they do not have, there will be conflict. Millions of people lack clean air, access to potable water, and even basic necessities such as food and shelter. Scarcity is not limited to human needs. Even if every family in the world ha has, uh, was wealthy enough to buy as big a mansion as they wanted, differences would still exist and that, that would make some people want what others have. Say a better view, a bigger lot, or proximity to certain amenities. In addition to desire, conflict will always uh, exist because people have differing beliefs and preferences, that is, differing values. Should abortion be legal? A spectrum of passionate views on the subject exists, and there is no way one political decision will satisfy all individuals at every point along that spectrum. Should governments spend taxpayer money on bike trails, mass transportation, or roads? The answer might not be a matter of deep belief, but it still elicits differing preferences. Again, no one political action is likely to satisfy everyone. Throughout history, the resolution of conflicts has often involved brute force. Violence can resolve conflicts, at least temporarily, with the strong getting what they want through brutality. Politics is the process for resolving conflicts over scarce resources and differing values without resorting to violence. When violence is used to solve disputes, it represents the failure of politics, or at least the deep frustration of those whose aspirations are thwarted by politics. Politics can determine how scarce resources will be allocated and which values will prevail. Through political processes, a country can decide whether, on, whether abortions will be allowed in all cases, some cases, or no cases. This does not mean that everyone will now agree on whether the policy is good or not. Politics can resolve issues. It cannot eliminate the underlying conflicts that cause them. In recent decades, the world has gotten richer and more peaceful. That does not mean conflict is disappearing. Several countries are experiencing open military conflict, and many other countries are experiencing high levels of violence. Even in countries without open, violent conflict, political polarization is increasing. Political polarization occurs when groups political parties as well as ethnic or religious become divided or polarized. Um, in ways that increase cohesion within the groups and also increase suspicion and distrust across the groups. The United States today is more polarized than it has been in many years. The greater the polarization, the greater the difficulty of resolving conflicts. Polarization is a risk to peaceful politics. How does politics resolve conflicts? Most often through bargaining. 
and parties involved in a conflict engage in negotiations concerning the status quo, that is, the existing set of circumstances involved in the conflict they are bargaining. Political bargaining determines whether existing rules and reality will be changed. In political bargaining, there are three likely outcomes. The first is that those bargaining simply cannot come to any agreement. When this happens, and it often does, the status quo prevails. Negotiations are almost certain to collapse when these bargaining, when those bargaining are unwilling to give an inch because they have diametrically opposed goals. If one side seeks to raise taxes, for example, and the other to lower them, then there is no deal that would be acceptable to both sides. In this situation, those who favor the status quo are the winners, so those who favor the status quo have been have reason to prevent the negotiations from succeeding. This point bears repeating. <clears throat> Although you might see a world full of problems that obviously need to be fixed, you should always assume that there are those who benefit from the current circumstances who will work to thwart change. This bias in favor of the status quo is one of the reasons political change is often so difficult to achieve. Think of it this way. Bargaining seeks to change the rules, and there are almost certainly those who benefit from those rules and want to keep them. A second possibility involves compromise in which the various participants in a conflict give ground on what they seek to seek in order to arrive at agreement. Compromise is most likely to occur when those bargaining generally agree on the goals but have disagreements on the specific details. If some countries seek to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to limit global climate change, while other countries seek faster economic growth that increases their emissions, the participants are seeking different goals and compromise is unlikely. However, if all countries want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, they are in general agreement about their goals. In this case, compromise is more likely if no country has, has the power unilaterally to set emission, set emission limits. The countries may have motivation to split the difference. If your country wants to lower emissions by 10% and my country wants to lower them by 5%, the two countries might make a deal and lower them by 7.5%. Each country gets part, but not all, of what they want. A third outcome results from what is called log rolling. If you have something I want and I have something you want, we each have something with which to bargain. For example, suppose you have a peach and an apple, as do I. We each like both fruits and want more of both. There is scarcity. But you really like apples and I really like peaches. Through log rolling, I give you my apple and in exchange, you will give me your peach. This is not a perfect solution, as we both wanted more apples and more peaches. But in the end, we are each better off than we were before the bargaining. The outcome of political negotiations depends again on the core principles of politics discussed earlier, the rules governing the negotiation, the reality at the time of the negotiation, and the strategic choices those involved in the negotiation make. Political negotiations are often a combination of high-minded principles and skullduggery. Negotiations will seek to persuade others and, if persuasions do not work, sometimes to bully or buy them. If any participant in a negotiation have the power to force the others to get ground, they are very, they very likely will use it. If the status quo prevails, those participants who sought change may be seen as weak and be blamed for their failure. If compromises are achieved, Participants may be criticized for selling out, for compromising not only their policies, but also their principles. Log rolling can create the impression of impropriety, of corrupt deal making, or of unseemingly quid pro quo, as in, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. Yet each, out each outcome has an alternative explanation. If the status quo prevails, those who defended it will laud their accomplishments. When compromises succeed, each side can claim that it, it is better to get half of a loaf of bread than no loaf at all. After a successful log roll, the negotiators can say, we got what we valued most. Negotiations can produce winners and losers, but they can also produce outcomes that leave the participants at least relatively satisfied with the outcomes. If all political power were concentrated in a single person, with the government proceeding by fiat or command, and the supreme leader giving the orders, bargaining might seem unnecessary. Yet even in totalitarian countries, 
the supreme leader will have advisors, and those advisors will negotiate among themselves and the ruler as they seek to influence how power is used. 1.3, political science, the systematic study of politics, learning outcomes. By the end of this section, you will be able to find political science described as the scientific study of politics. The systematic study of the process of who gets what, when, and how, political science investigates the reasons behind the decisions government make, governments make. For example, political scientists investigate the degree of control governments choose to exercise over various forms of communication. Like your smartphone, political scientists examine both the ways individuals and groups seek to influence governmental action and the ways government go, governmental decisions in turn affect individuals and groups. Political scientists may not have lab coats or electron microscopes, but like other types of scientists, they use theory, logic, and evidence in an attempt to answer questions, to make predictions, or to arrive at conclusions. Some political scientists strive to understand the fundamental laws of politics in much the same way theoretical physicists seek to comprehend the cosmos through pure knowledge. These political scientists try to uncover the universal principles of how humans and their institutions aim to prevail in political conflicts. But most political scientists accept that human behavior is not entirely deterministic. So they instead look for patterns that may enable them to predict in general how humans and their institutions interact. Other political scientists are more deadly or more like chemists who may use their knowledge to develop and improve medicines or create more deadly toxins. These political scientists aspire to improve the institutions or processes of government. Some uses of political science are not so benign. Motivated actors can and have used political science uh, knowledge to manipulate voters and suppress vulnerable populations. When people understand how political science works, they are less susceptible to such manipulation and suppression. So what is scientific about politics? One way to think about whether politics is scientific is to focus on the, co the content of politics. Does political behavior follow general laws? That is, does it align with universal statements about nature based on empirical observations? Does politics have an equivalent of Isaac Newton's laws of motion? Not precisely, although political scientists have at times chimed claimed that such laws exist. The sticking point is the word universal. Force always equals mass multiplied by acceleration. To every action, there is always an equal and opposite reaction. In politics, it seems, virtually nothing is always the case. If one defines science as a body of universal laws about an unchanging universe, then politics is not and cannot be a science. Politics is not the same as physics. Empirical political science seeks to identify regularities, what is likely to happen given certain conditions. Political science is probabilistic rather than deterministic. An event is deterministic if it is possible to say, if this happens, that will happen. Events are probabilistic if one can only say, if this happens, that is likely to happen. The sun coming up in the east, deterministic. Will it rain in the morning? Probabilistic. Will incumbents win their next bid for re-election? Political science gives us the ability to estimate the probability that they will win. So science does not really require universal laws that explain an unchanging universe. What science does require is a way to learn about the world around us. This way is the scientific method. <clears throat> the scientific method seeks to understand the world by testing hypotheses, by systematically collecting data sufficient to test that hypothesis, and by making these hypotheses and data available to others so that your work can be challenged or verified Political science uses the scientific method to understand the political world. Political science carefully and methodolo methodologi met methodically uses logic and evidence to find answers to political questions. A hypothesis is a tentative statement about reality that can be tested to determine whether it is true or false, or in practice, supporter or supported or unsupported based on the evidence. A candidate's ethnicity influences the likelihood that they will be elected is an example of a hypothesis. Ethnicity either does or does not influence election outcomes. An important task of the political scientist is to determine whether the evidence supports the hypothesis that they test. The answers scientists find are always tentative or uncertain. A hypothesis is supported rather than true or unsupported rather than false. Additional research may yield different answers as theories or methods improve 
or better data emerges, but also because political behavior itself can change in response to what people learn about it. The, pe the knowledge, for example, that politicians are likely to act in a certain way given certain circumstances might lead politicians to change their behavior if they believe that doing so will gain them an advantage. The specific knowledge may become obsolete even if a, a broader general principle still appear, appears to be true. There are two main interrelated types of political science, normative political science and empirical political science. 1.4, normative political science, learning outcomes. By the end of this section, you will be able to <clears throat> identify what normative political science seeks to do, discuss the primary methods political philosophers seek, uh, use to answer their questions, list the three main ways normative political scientists have tried to answer questions like, what is a good citizen? In politics, what is good and what is right? How should power be used? What is the public interest? These are tricky questions with multiple answers. One might think of the good as that which beneficial, which, which is beneficial or helpful and right uh, as what is just true or just. Power should be used to promote the public interest so that those in power use it to benefit the people. Normative political science seeks to understand the meaning, purposes, and goals of politics. It seeks to define how individuals should behave and how institutions should be constituted. Those who study these issues are referred to as political philosophers and share common interests with the broader discipline of philosophy. Normative political science considers an endless array of questions. What is a good citizen? Do human rights exist? And if so, what are they? Who should rule? What purpose should government serve? Is there an ideal constitution? And if so, what is it? What is social justice? These questions cannot be answered by presenting evidence alone. There is no test that would prove beyond a reasonable doubt what a good citizen is, or that any constitution is, an, is, a fact, is in fact ideal. <clears throat> so normative political science typically proceeds primarily by appealing to logic and reason. Consider the question, what is a good citizen? Evidence alone cannot tell us what constitutes a good citizen. It is a good citizen, the one who always obeys the laws uh, or the one who challenges the laws they see as unjust. Reasonable people can and do disagree on, on, on this and almost all other questions in political theory. But in order to determine through logic and reason what it means to be a good citizen, evidence can guide judgments of whether citizens are good Normative theorists have tried to answer questions like, what is a good citizen, in three main ways, focusing on the consequences of behavior, moral rules, and virtue. One definition of a good citizen is someone who acts in ways that benefit society. That is, the benefits are a consequence of the citizen's actions. A good citizen votes and pays taxes, for example because both actions help to create stable and prosperous societies. In contrast, a bad citizen is one who breaks the law to the extent that breaking the law harms other people. In this view, someone who speeds would be a bad citizen because speeding increases the likelihood of causing a crash and harming others. But someone who commits a victimless, victimless crime, such as smoking marijuana, would not be a bad citizen because they would not be harming anyone else. According to normative political science, a person should ha uh, behave in ways that benefit society and do not harm it. An individual should strive to be good citizens. A good ruler is one who helps the ruled rather than harming them. <clears throat> According to Aristotle, constitutions that aim at the common advantage are correct and just, whereas those which aim only at the advantage of the rulers are deviant and unjust, because they involve despotic rule which is inappropriate for a community of free persons. <clears throat> Two challenges are central to this type of theorizing. What actions produce more benefit than harm and what evidence support these claims? For example, speeding is a risk to the driver and to others, but it may bring pleasure to the driver and enables them to get where they are going faster. Do the costs outweigh the benefits? Moreover, what counts as a potential, a benefit or a harm? <clears throat> is it beneficial or harmful to citizens to monitor one another's behavior for potential law breaking, for example? Philosophers, and not just political philosophers, attempt to identify a set of moral principles that good citizens should adopt. Similarly, they have attempted to identify principle, principles governments should adhere to because those principles are moral. 
For example, a good citizen would treat others as they themselves would want to be treated. A good citizen would not lie because lying is wrong. In practice, it is proven hard to identify rules that are universally consistent or accepted. Is it always going? Is it always wrong to lie? What if a government decides it must lie to an adversary in order to protect its own citizens? Does a good government not, as a rule, have an obligation to do just that? But does this then create a slippery slope in which governments believe they are justified in lying as a matter of course? Some normative political scientists seek to identify and understand character traits that are admirable in their own right, rather than arguing that good citizens should tell the truth because lying harms the public interest or violates a universal moral principle. They argue that good citizens should tell the truth because a good person does not lie. According to this line of thinking, a government protects its citizens because doing so improves their lives and because it fulfills their, the duties of government, but also because doing so is what makes a good government. That is what good governments do. <clears throat> Political philosophers studying virtue seek to identify and define the virtues, as well as to discover their limits. For, for example, traits like bravery, integrity, humility, and kindness have been identified as possible sources of virtue. A good person and a good citizen is brave enough to stand up for the right in opposition to the wrong. To do otherwise would be a sign of cowardice, but can a person be too brave, becoming foolhardy or rash when standing up for what is right? These three types of normative reasoning, emphasizing consequences, rules, and virtue overlap, but they represent distinctly different ways of thinking about politics and what ideal politics would be like. Although the questions they raise have been studied since ancient times, they remain relevant for us today and are still worthy of careful reflection. 1.5, Empirical Political Science. <clears throat> Learning Outcomes. By the end of this section, you will be able to distinguish empirical political science from normative political science. Explain what facts are and why they may be disputed. Define generalization and discuss when generalizations can be helpful. Unlike normative political science, Empirical political science is based on not on uh, what should be, but what it is. What is? <clears throat> it seeks to describe the real world of politics, distinguishing between what is predictable and what is idiosyncratic. Empirical pol political science attempts to explain and predict. Empirical political science assumes that facts exist, actual, genuine, verifiable facts. Empirical questions are ones that can be answered by factual evidence. The number of votes a candidate receives in an, is an empirical matter votes can be counted. Counting votes accurately so that each candidate receives the actual number of votes that were cast for them can be difficult. Different ways of counting can lead to slightly different counts, but a correct number actually exists. A fact may be disputed. There may be genuine uncertainty as to what the facts really are, what the evidence really shows. Sometimes it is extremely difficult to gather the facts. Do space aliens exist? That is an empirical question. Whether space aliens exist or not, or they do not, some researchers claim to have evidence that space aliens are real, but their evidence is not universally or even broadly accepted. One side of this garment is correct, however, and the other is not. Evidence is not, uh, has not yet conclusively determined which is correct. Does the Russian government seek to interfere with American elections, and if so, does its interference affect the outcome? The first part of the question is difficult. To answer because when a country interferes in another country's domestic affairs, it tries to do so in secret. It is difficult to uncover secrets. But the second part of the question, does the interference affect the outcome, is almost impossible to answer because so many factors influence election outcomes. It is extremely challenging to determine which individual factors made any consequential difference. There are thus empirical debates in which people of good faith disagree about what the facts are. In many cases, however, people do not want to acknowledge what the evidence shows and because they do not want to believe what the facts demonstrate. They insist the evidence cannot be true. Humans often use motivated reasoning, first deciding what is true, for example, gun control makes us safer or gun control makes us less safe, and then finding evidence that supports this belief while rejecting data that contradicts it. In other cases, individuals and interests may actually know what the facts are, but they are motivated by reasons of self-interest to deny them. The evidence is clear, for example, that nicotine is addictive and harmful to human health. The evidence is also clear that Big Tobacco, the largest cigarette companies, denied these facts for years because to admit them would have put their profits at risk. 
Former President Donald Trump, along with his many, many of his supporters, claims that he won the 2020 election and that President Joe Biden was declared the victor only because of massive voter fraud, voter fraud. All attempts to prove that fraud led to Biden's victory have failed. No evidence has been found to support Trump's claims that these claims continue to be attributed to the fact that some individuals are simply unwilling to accept the evidence, while others benefit from dying, denying the validity of it. Empirical political science might find, based on the available evidence, that individuals with more education or more income are more likely to vote. <clears throat> Empirical political science would not consider whether this is good or bad. That would be a normative judgment. Empirical political scientists might explain the link between education, income, and voting by positing that better educated, more prosperous individuals are more likely to believe that their views matter and that because of that belief, they are more likely to express those views at the ballot box. These political scientists might also use their findings to make a prediction. An individual with more education or higher income is more likely to vote than an individual with less education or lower income. Based on this finding, empirical pol political scientists make no claims as to who should participate in politics. Question about should or the domain of normative political science Moral judgments cannot be made strictly on the basis of empirical statements that members of one group vote higher at, other, at higher rates than other group, for example, tells us nothing about whether they deserve to vote at higher rates or whether government policy should be based on more, based more on their views as compared to those who vote on, at lower rates. From this finding, however, empirical political scientists may infer a generalization. Generalizations are based on typical cases. Average results and general findings. Younger adults, for instance, typically vote less often than older adults. This does not mean that any specific young adult does not vote or that any specific older adult does. But that these statements are generally true. Generalizations can be helpful in describing, explaining, or predicting but there is a downside to generalizations, stereotyping. <clears throat> if the evidence shows that political conservatives in the United States are opposed to higher levels of immigration, this means neither that every conservative holds this belief nor that one must hold this belief to be conservative. If data suggests supporters of abortion rights tend to be women, it is not possible to infer from the evidence that all women seek more permissive abortion laws or that no men do. In using generalizations, it is important to remember that they are descriptive of groups, not individuals. These are empirical statements, not normative ones. They cannot by themselves be used to assign blame or credit. Empirical political science can be used to make predictions, but predictions are prone to error. Can political science knowledge be useful for predicting the outcome of elections, for example? Yes, given a set of rules about who is eligible to vote, how votes can be cast, and what different categories of voters believe about the candidates or policy options on the ballot. Political science knowledge can be useful in predicting the outcome of the election. Our predictions might be wrong. Maybe people did not tell the truth about who they were planning to vote for. Maybe the people who said they were going to vote did not. In 2016, most political polls predicted that Hillary Clinton would be elected president of the United States. Clinton did indeed win the popular vote, as the pollsters anticipated, but Donald Trump won the electoral vote against the pollsters' expectations. Political science is imperfect, but it seeks to learn from and correct its mistakes. You will learn more about the public opinion polling in chapter five, political participation and public opinion. <clears throat> Many of the terms in this book, like incumbent, are relatively irrelevant, mainly for the study of politics. Other terms like ceteris paribus are useful across a, band, a broad range of studies that use the scientific method. Ceteris paribus can be translated as all other things being equal. If the ethnicity of a political candidate does not influence the probability of getting elected to office, ceteris paribus, if there is only two candidates, and if they are alike in every relevant aspect, except their ethnicity, then the candidate's ethnicity by itself does not affect the outcome of the election. In real life, however, all other things are almost never equal. Uh, to the extent that our societies, excuse me, have inequalities of wealth, health, and education and other resources, the inequalities tend to be correlated, that is, mutually related to each other. For example, wealth and health are correlated with each other 
in that wealthier people tend to have better health and poorer individuals tend to have poorer health. In the United States, whites tend, on average, to have more wealth. Health and education and other social resources and persons of color. This does not mean that every white person is wealthier and healthier, but that on average, in general, they tend to be. <clears throat> Empirical, political science, and political philosophy are distinct modes of inquiry, but this is not to say that they are conflicting, that one is better than the others, or that political scientists do not use both in their research. If empirical researchers discover that certain groups are systematically disadvantaged in the political process, the researchers may also argue that these advantages are harmful or wrong and make a moral argument that the disadvantages should be reduced or eliminated. Empirical research is often inspired by normative concerns. Those who believe that human rights should be better protected may undertake research to understand the political factors that limit the protections of rights. 1.6, individuals, groups, institutions, and international relations. Oh, is this training? Oh, oh that's so good. By the end of this section, you will be able to explain why it makes sense to begin learning about political science with a study of individual behavior, discuss what human motivations, political ideologies, and public opinion have in common, distinguish between civil liberties and civil rights, and explain why the former are examined in the, in the section on individuals and the latter in the section on groups. Identify the key types of groups and institutions involved in politics. Identify the central themes in international relations and globalization. To develop your understanding of the key concepts and content in politics and political science, this book begins with the micro, focusing on the smallest political unit, the individual, in part two. Part three turns to individuals acting collectively through groups. When groups become formalized by establishing rules and developing common practices, they become institutions, the focus of part four. Finally, part five examines how clusters of institutions, whether within the government of a single country or across countries through international organizations comprise a macro level view of politics. All politics is based on human behavior, on how individuals interact with each other, so that this so that, that so that is where our political exploration begins. Chapter two, political behavior is human behavior, considers questions in political philosophy, such as what are human rights and what is social justice. The chapter then examines empirically how individuals individuals generally make decisions, whether in political action or in any other context. Two ideas stand out. First, humans act instrumentally or strategically or rationally as they pursue their goals. Second, much of human behavior serves expressive and emotional ends. Chapter three explores political ideology. Ideology is a set of beliefs, a systematic set of concepts that helps individuals make sense of the world and their place in it. Ideologies help guide an individual's decisions regarding what is right and wrong, good and bad, and appropriate and inappropriate. Your political ideology determines in part how you see the proper roles of citizens and their governments. Although ideology is individual, you only you can determine your political ideology. It connects you to many others in the same way that those with non or similar religious beliefs gather together. Ideology is both an individual and a group phenomenon. The essential freedoms and rights to which all humans are entitled, human rights, can be divided into two categories. Chapter four examines the first category, civil liberties, which involve individual freedoms to think and act without government interference. Later, chapter seven considers the civil right groups, rights groups have to do certain things like voting or gaining access to public buildings. Citizens around the world ask their governments to protect and defend their human rights, both as groups, their civil rights, and, their in, and as individuals, for civil liberties, yet the boundaries of these human rights are disputed and they are frequently under attack. The last chapter in part two explores political participation and public opinion. Political participation includes all the various ways you and others can engage in the political process. In democracies, voting may be the most important and most common form of political participation, but there are countless other ways to participate. Even watching or reading political information is a form of participation Although, as Tufts University professor Eaton Hirsch warns, if people only consume political news rather than acting on it, they are hobbyists rather than engaged citizens. Individuals also have their own political opinions. 
but these opinions are aggregated into group categories and reported as public opinion. Chapter five examines how polls are constructed and how they are converted individual view, how they convert individual views into valid measures of public opinion. Political participation in public opinion bridge individual and group behavior. When individuals vote as Republicans or Democrats, contact public schools on behalf of the Sierra Club or, on the, or the NRA, or march in support of Black Lives Matter or the right to life, they are also participating as members of a political party, interested group, or social movement. A political pollster asks questions of individuals, but their answers are, are reported by group affiliations like a majority of Republicans believe or supporters of BLM generally favor. Political action invariably, invariably involves groups, and part three examines different aspects of group behavior, rights, and forms of political action. Chapter six, the fundamentals of group political activity. Should remind you of chapter two, political behavior is human behavior. Both chapters consider two aspects of human behavior, the irrational, exp expressive, and symbolic elements, as well as the rational, instrumental, and strategic components. The first part of the chapter examines political socialization and political culture. Political socialization is the gradual process by which individuals develop their political personality over time, and this personality is heavily influenced by others in their environment. Their family and friends, people in their schools and places of worship, and more broadly, people in their social networks. Political culture is the common set of political attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors characterizing a group, whether the group is a country or a community of any sort. The second part of the chapter introduces the concept of collective dilemmas. The logic underlying our difficulty in overcoming them and potential ways to resolve these dilemmas. Collective dilemmas occur whenever multiple individuals interact with one another to make a group decision. Problems arise when they disagree on what the solution should be or even how to decide what to do. A special form of collective dilemmas, collective action problems, exists when individuals have incentives not to cooperate with others even though cooperation would benefit the group as a whole. Chapter seven, focus, focuses on individual rights. Governments must take action for these rights to exist in practice, and governments typically extend these rights to certain groups. Consider the right to vote. For this right to be exercised, the government must provide places to vote, ballots, and ballot counters. When voting rights are extended or withdrawn, they are extended to or withdrawn from specific groups. Voting rights were extended to African Americans in 1870, in the United States and to women in Switzerland in 1971. In Ethiopia, Nicaragua, and Scotland, 16-year-olds have the right to vote. Because governments must take action for civil rights to be realized, they are matters of intense political debate. Contests over civil rights, in fact, political battles over every issue, usually involve group conflict, competition, and cooperation. Chapter 8 focuses on interest groups, political parties, and elections. Interest groups are organizations of individuals united by common identities and goals who seek to obtain their objectives through political action. Political parties are organizations that try to gain political power, most often in democracies by running their candidates for office. The main goal of interest groups is to influence public policy, including by supporting political parties as they try to win elections. Political parties seek to win elections in order to set public policy as their candidates enter office. Interest groups, political parties, and elections are inextricably, inextricably linked. Political science is fundamentally about, oh, no, hold on. Part three moves to, a, to yet a higher level of complexity. Political institutions and institution is an organization with a set of rules and practices that inform its members about their relationships with one another and how they should interact. Institutions may be formal with written rules or they may be informal. Your family is an institution, and if you belong to a religious faith, faith, it is an institution too. Gangs are institutions, as are businesses. Our main interest in this book is institutions that are part of the political system, either because they are part of the government or they seek to influence it. Ugh. Ugh. The first three chapters in part four introduce you to three types of institutions likely to exist within any government, a legislature, an, ex an executive branch, and a judiciary. As discovered or as discussed in chapter nine, legislatures, a legislature is an institution composed of individuals who have the power to propose, deliberate on, adopt, and alter the laws of a state. 
Parliaments, congregas, congresses, and national assemblies are all examples of legislatures. In democracies, legislatures are elected. In non-democratic non states, they may, they may be appointed by a supreme authority. The United States, like about 40% of the world's democracies, has a bicameral or two-chamber legislature. The other democracies have unicameral or one-chamber legislatures. Chapter 10 turns to executives and the executive branch, which includes cabinets and bureaucracies. The chief executive of a country goes by various titles, such as president, premier, or prime minister, and their responsibilities vary from country to country. This person may be the head of the government, but the powers of a chief executive officer, the head of state, the ceremonial powers, or both. A chief executive's cabinet composed of the leaders of the various governmental industries, such as defense, treasury, or interior affairs supports the chief executive. The bureaucracy ex executes most of the functions of a government from defending the country to delivering its mail, serving under the direction of the chief executive and their, and their cabinet. The courts are institutions established to interpret and apply a country's laws regarding criminal, civil, and in some cases, constitutional disputes. They can be either appointed or elected. The courts and the judges, justices are more powerful when they can are politically independent. This means they can decide cases and issue rulings without facing retribution from the voters or the legislature, legislative and executive branches. In the United States, for example, the Supreme Court can void laws and policies of the legislative and executive branches that it deems unconstitutional. In other countries, the courts largely serve at the direction of other politicians. Chapter 11, Courts and Law, describes what courts do, the different types of legal systems and questions regarding their power and its limits. Chapter 12 introduces the news media and its role in politics. The news media, often called the fourth branch of government, is itself an institution. The news media, whether owned or controlled by a government or commit commercial business, is evolving rapidly. 30 years ago, the news media could be defined as including television, radio, newspapers, and magazines. Today, with the rise of social media platforms that allow users to share and stream videos, Images and text, the news media is almost literally anyone with a smartphone and internet access. And although misinformation and disinformation have always been part of the political world, social media speed and scope for spreading fake news is unprecedented. Democracies require a free press, one that operates without go government interference, but they also require a press that reports real, not fake, news. Legislatures, executives, and courts are the institutions that together compose the three formal branches of the country's government. And the media, as the fourth branch, serving to keep uh, the other three branches honest by reporting on their activities. Part five moves beyond individual institutions to explore the politics of countries and the relations between them. Chapter 13 looks within individual countries or states to describe the different types of governing regimes or systems of government that exist around the world. The chapter highlights two main regime characteristics, how concentrated or distributed governmental power is and how the government is structured. The broader it is the distribution of government power, the more democratic the country, the more concentrated the distribution, the more authoritarian the regime. Structurally, governing regimes can be unitary where all legal authority resides within the national government where they can be federal like the United States where national and state governments each have their own legitimate sources of power. <clears throat> Big questions concerning the relations among countries are at the heart of chapter 14, international relations. The chapter begins by discussing the different ways political actors will power in the international system. The structure of the system and the different actors within it are then examined. Political scientists have different perspectives on how to interpret the motivations and behavior of countries and their relationships with each other, and the most prominent of these perspectives, including realism, liberalism, and constructivism, as well as critical theories that challenge traditional viewpoints or outlines. <clears throat> as the countries of the world have interacted with each other, they have developed institutions to help overcome their collective dilemmas. Chapter 15, International Law and International Organizations introduces the purposes and work of the most important international organizations, such as the United Nations, the European Union and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. <laughs> Asian. 
The chapter goes on to examine military alliances like NATO. These organizations all have countries as members, but the international political environment also contains important non non-state actors, including legal ones, such as multinational corporations and financial institutions and non-legal ones like drug cartels and terrorist groups. Hmm. The final chapter focuses on the international political economy. International political economy concerns itself with the impact of political actions on domestic and international economies. If politics is about who gets what, when, where, how, and why, IPE tells us who the winners and losers are, how they got that way, and analyzes the tactics they may employ to maintain or improve their position. Winners and losers may be governments, private interests, or social classes, among many others, and the chapter concludes with a discussion of current widespread crises confronting winners and losers with stark choices regarding poverty, inequality, and environmental degradation. All right, and that's it for Political Science, Chapter 1.